In section 3.4, we're going to fine-tune some of the things that we know about these polynomial functions in order to help us be able to graph them. Um, and some of it you probably already understand. If you don't know it specifically, you probably know it somewhat intuitively. And so here's what we're going to look at at first. If you check these three graphs, the first one is f of x equals x. The second one is f of x equals x to the third. The last one is f of x equals x to the fifth. They have some things in common. Hopefully, you will recognize if I were to ask you about the degree, remember when we did that at the very first of chapter three? These all have odd degree. The first one is x to the first, the next one is x to the third, the last one is x to the fifth. And if I were to ask you, when you think about the discussion we had regarding the type of symmetry you see for functions that are even or for functions that are odd, hopefully you would recognize this is an odd function because I have symmetry about the origin. Notice if we were to put a pin at the origin with these graphs, if we spin 180 degrees, it will look identical. Now the domain on each one is negative infinity to positive infinity, as well as the range. And it is continuous everywhere. We don't have any gaps or stops or starts, no holds anywhere. So negative infinity to positive infinity would be our interval of continuity. Now these odd functions are also increasing on the entire domain because if I look at these graphs, and again our domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity, and if I look at these graphs, on the left side it looks as though it is falling to the left, but it looks as if it is rising to the right. So those are some common characteristics when we see these odd exponents. Now if you look at the next group of graphs, what you should notice is our exponents are now 2, 4, and 6. So each figure above would have an even degree. And I know these aren't odd functions because I don't see symmetry about the origin, but do you recognize a line of symmetry that does exist, hopefully so. These are even functions because they have symmetry about the y-axis. If I fold on the y-axis, the halves will match. Now let me just point out, as these exponents increase, for instance, if you look at f of x equals x to the sixth, it's not that this graph has a number of x values that share the same y value of zero. That is not the case. It's just that it appears to flatten out more. There's just very little change in the y values um, for those x values that are so close together because of being raised to the sixth power. It just means the change on those small numbers is going to be very, very little. But it isn't completely um, flat there. It just appears to look flat because of some of our limitations with graphing. Now, we do know something about the domains on these. Hopefully you could tell me the domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity. But my range is restricted. The smallest value you see in the range is zero. Remember, we have to read range from bottom to top. And it starts at zero, goes to positive infinity. Now, you need to ask yourself, does zero need a parenthesis or a bracket? It's a bracket. These even functions are also continuous on the entire domain from negative infinity to positive infinity. However, we do not have um, the entire function increasing or decreasing. Instead, we have sections um, that we'll be doing each. So if I asked you what happens from negative infinity to zero, hopefully you'll recognize as you move from left to right, when you hit the graph, as you move towards zero, you're going down. So we are decreasing 
on the section from negative infinity to zero and increase from zero to positive infinity. In other words, if you were to describe how this appears, you might say it looks as if they both rise on the left and the right side both. Now, we can summarize again some of the things we automatically know about polynomial functions. Again, if that a value is greater than 1, then we know that the graph is stretched vertically. And if I were to ask you how that makes it appear, it would make it appear narrower. Sorry for the messy writing. Now, if the a value is between 0 and 1, then the graph would be compressed, is one way we could say it, or we might want to say shrunk vertically, and that would make it appear wider. All right, if that a value happens to be negative, what I do know is this graph is reflected across the x-axis. And if I see that there is something added at the end, then this graph is translated or shifted k units which way if the k is a positive number greater than zero. That means it's going to be k units up. But if k is less than zero, it gets translated k units down. Now, if I happen to notice that something is happening just to the x, I see x minus h in parentheses raised to a power, then what that tells me is that it's translated h units which way if the h is positive. So if I saw something like x minus 3, that would mean that we would be going 3 units to the right. Remember, it's the opposite sign. If, if I see minus h and h is positive, then it looks like it's a negative number after the x. So I'm actually going to be moving um, h units to the right, but we'll go h units to the left if h is less than 0 because if h is less than 0, x minus a negative number will turn it into x plus something. And if I happen to see all these things happening simultaneously, I've got a combination of transformations. So that's just a reminder that we can have multiple things occur at the same time in these equations. Now another piece of important information is what actually happens at the zeros. Please tune into this because we're going to need it by the end of this section so we can graph. Here's what we should recognize. As long as I know a zero occurs only one time, if, if I determine that these are my zeros and one particular value, I've only got it one time listed as a zero, then that means that my graph will simply cross the x-axis at that point because I have a multiplicity of 1. It's only a 0 one time. It's not doing anything funny as it crosses the x-axis. It just passes through. But if I had a multiplicity that is even, say it was a 0 two times, then what happens is that value will simply uh, be the single point where the graph touches it, turns around, and goes back the other direction. It won't actually cross over, it just touches. So this is a cross when it is multiplicity of 1. If it's an even multiplicity, we'll say that it's a touch, or you might call it a bounce. Touches the graph and bounces off. Now, if we happen to have odd multiplicity greater than 1. Maybe we find out we've got this 0, but it happens three times that it's a 0. It will cross through, but it crosses through with a wiggle. So in other words, it doesn't go straight through. We see it a curve. What it actually is, is a change in concavity. If you take calculus, you will learn a little more about how to determine um, this issue of concavity. We won't be able to do that in college algebra. I'll just let you know that it would take calculus in order to actually determine this. But what that means, if I look at these examples, 
it doesn't change from increasing to decreasing within the graph. If you look at this one right here, moving from left to right, it's increasing the whole way. But if you will notice, if I look to the left of C, what I have is a section of the graph that you would say is concave down. Sort of uh, like turning a bowl upside down. But if you look to the right of C, this section is concave up. It would be like having a bowl that's upright. We're still increasing across this entire function, but there's a point of concavity where there's a subtle shift in the way that it's curved. Okay, that's going to be helpful when we get ready to graph. Turning points and end behavior. This is another um, area that calculus would be needed in order to find these exactly. What I do want you to know is that if I have a polynomial that is degree n, doesn't really matter what it is, but whatever that largest exponent is, at most I can have n minus 1 turning points. I cannot have any more turning points than that. Now I don't have to have that many, but that's the most I can have. And there would have to be at least one turning point between each uh, pair of successive zeros. So if I'm going to have two zeros on my graph, there had to be a turning point between them in order for that to exist. So what we're going to look at will be in behavior, excuse me, and we're going to begin with odd degree polynomial functions. That's what that means for us. If we're talking about an odd degree, so if you were to look back at those graphs on the very first page of this lesson where we saw that whether it was x to the first, x to the third, x to the fifth, remember we had opposite end behaviors. It went down on the left and it went up on the right. So here's what we know. The end behaviors were opposite or different. And what that means is um, as long as the A value is positive, then as X approaches positive infinity, as we move to the right, the Y's will also be increasing. They will approach positive infinity. And as we move toward the left, as, as X approaches negative infinity, the Y's approach negative infinity. Now, I realize that math language can be kind of confusing. Don't worry so much about that. Instead, here's the part you need to know. Symbolically, that means that the graph is going down on the left side, up on the right. Now, notice I have a gap in the middle because somewhere in between, I've got all kinds of things going on. It's crossing the x-axis. It's got all kinds of turning points, so there's lots of wiggling in between. I'm simply indicating I know this is what happens on the ends. Now, if the a is less than zero, if that coefficient on the first term when it's in descending order is a negative number, what that means is instead of increasing across the whole graph, it's been reflected over the x-axis, which means it's now going up on the left and down on the right. And I won't even make you fill in the symbols on um, the first part of these. You just need to get what the end behavior looks like symbolically. Now, if you go to the even degree functions, then Think about it in terms of a parabola. As long as the a is positive, if I have a positive number in front of the x squared, I know it means that the parabola would open up. So that means any polynomial, if it's even degree for the biggest term, I look at that coefficient, and as long as it's a positive number, then it's going to open up. Again, I'm going to have wiggles in the middle, so I leave a gap there, but I will draw the end behavior. If it happens to be a negative number, if a is less than zero, then that means this parabola opens down. So all you need to know is what the symbols look like, and if you're asked to use the symbols for in behavior, then this is what we'll do. Look at a. f of x equals negative x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus x minus 8. First thing you want to do is check to see that it's in descending order. If it's not, 
You either need to put it in descending order or identify what would be your leading term, whatever term has the biggest exponent. Well, this is in descending order, and the only thing I need to look at is that negative x to the fourth, simply the first term in descending order. Now, here's what I know. The exponent tells me whether it's even or odd, because it's a four that makes it even, which means I know my end behavior is doing the same thing. It's either both up or both down. As I look at the coefficient, I see it's a negative one. And because it's negative, that tells me these both go down. And that's all I'm doing, is I'm just looking at that one term to decide in behavior. Look at B. Again, it's in descending order. I look at the first term, and it's x to the third. Now the exponent is three. That's the part that tells me whether it's even or odd. Well, that's gotta be odd because three is an odd number. If I look at the coefficient, the coefficient is a positive one. So the fact that it is positive and it's odd tells me that it goes down on the left, up on the right. In other words, I would look at it and it would be increasing over the entire uh, graph when I'm, I'm just looking at what happens on the ends. So it's down on the left, up on the right, as long as it was positive. If it was negative, it would be reflected. It would be the other way around. Next one, descending order already. I have negative x to the fifth. So again, my exponent is a five. That tells me it's odd. But the coefficient is a negative one. And since it's odd and it's negative, odd means it does opposite things on end behavior. So it would be up on the left, down on the right. In other words, overall, it looks like it's decreasing. The last one, I look at the first term and it's x to the sixth. So that tells me that it's even because the exponent is six and the coefficient is positive because it's a positive one. Now I realize all these examples were either a positive one or negative one on the coefficient. Oftentimes you will see numbers other than one, so don't let that make you think that you won't ever see anything other than just uh, a positive one or a negative one. Uh, it can be any number, but I just need to pay attention to the sign of the coefficient and to what the exponent is. And since this is even and positive, that tells me both ends will go up. Now, to put all of this together, we're going to figure out step by step how we could graph a polynomial function. We already know if it's linear, we can just choose x's, plug in, get the y. Once we have three points, we could graph a line. When it's quadratic, we just learned how we can find the vertex, use the axis of symmetry, and we can plot a parabola. If it's something that has a higher degree than two, we need some techniques. And so the very first thing that we will do is we're going to find the real zeros of our function. In other words, it's important for me to know where is it crossing the x-axis, or where is it touching, or where is it wiggling as it goes through. And I have to plot them as x-intercepts. So that means I'll need to pay attention to how many times it occurs as a zero. Now, in step two, we're going to find the y-intercept. And in order to find the y-intercept, that means we'll use f of zero. Because in addition to knowing where those x-intercepts are, it would be very helpful for us to know where it crosses the y-axis. It will only cross in one place. Um, and Ideally, it would be wonderful if we could find all the turning points, but without calculus, we really can't do that very easily. So the last thing we're going to do is use end behavior to complete the graph. So here's what we will be able to do. We'll be able to get a general idea of the shape. We're going to know what happens on the ends. We're going to know where the x-intercepts are. 
what we're going to be guessing at will be where those turning points occur. And we'll do the best job we can with it. But if I gave you some graphs to choose from, if it were multiple choice, I believe you would be able to choose the right one. So let's look first function that we have. And one of the things that um, I have told you is that I will not ask you to use the rational zeros theorem in order to get started on this instead. I would give you one zero. So I'm going to tell you that there is a zero at negative three. Okay? And from that, you're going to find the other zeros. So remember, that's our first thing we need to do is find our x-intercepts um, so we'll be able to plot them. Now, in order to get the other zeros, I'm going to need to use synthetic division. Let's get the row of coefficients. Two, three, negative eleven, negative six, I didn't have any missing terms, and since I told you you have a zero at negative three, we're going to bring down this first term. I have two. Two times negative three is negative six. Three minus six is a negative three. Negative three times negative three is positive nine. If I add those together, I get negative two, and a negative three times a negative two is a positive six. Adding those up does give me zero, which is good. That means that it really is a zero at negative three. And at this point, remember, we can insert the variables in the exponents again. So since our first term was an x cubed, this is now an x squared. 2x squared minus 3x minus 2. And we need to factor that in order to find our other zeros. So again, you can use your methods for factoring. If you were to use your AC method, then what I know is the a value is 2, the c value is negative 2, multiply that together, and I get negative 4. So I need a pair of numbers that will multiply to give me negative 4, but add to give me the b value, which is negative 3. Well, the pair that I need would have to, if I'm multiplying to get a negative, I've got to have a negative times a positive, and that would mean I need a negative 4 and a positive 1. I'll replace this middle term with minus 4x plus 1x minus 2, factoring by grouping now, pulling out my GCF, I get 2x times x minus 2, plus, because I match the sign in the middle, the GCF in the second pair is just 1, and that will give me x minus 2 in parentheses. The reason we're factoring by grouping is by changing the three terms to four terms, hopefully we can get a new common factor in the parentheses, and that is what we have. So this is going to factor into 2x plus 1 times x minus 2. Now remember, you don't have to factor using this method. You may have a different way of factoring, but if you use a different method, you still should have these two parentheses. I still don't have zeros unless I set this equal to zero and I solve um, by setting each parentheses equal to zero. That's how I'm going to determine where my other zeros occur. So 2x plus 1 equals zero. Also x minus 2 equals zero. So I'm going to end up with 2x equals negative 1 or x is negative 1 half. Also, when I add 2 to each side here, I get a 0 at positive 2. So I have zeros at negative 3, negative 1 half, and positive 2. Those are my three zeros. And remember, the most number of real zeros I can have would match my exponent. And this has my um, leading term has an exponent of 3. These are the only zeros I have, would be these three zeros. Now, I'm, what I'm supposed to do is to plot these as x-intercepts. So I'm going to come to the graph here, and I'm going to put a 0 at negative 3. I'm going to have one at negative 1 half. And I'm going to have one at positive 2. So my zeros, I'll write them down. And they all had multiplicity of 1. So I know when I 
graph this, I don't have to worry about bounces or wiggles. They're just going to cross through those points. Now, step two was find my y-intercept. And the, remember, we find the y-intercept when we find f of zero. Now, my function was 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 11x minus 6. So what I'm going to do is plug in 0 everywhere I have an x, clean this up, and I determine when x is 0, y is negative 6. And I need to go put that on my graph. So my y-intercept occurs down here at 0, negative 6. Now, step three was to determine in behavior. And if you remember, for in behavior, the only thing I have to look at is that leading term. I'm just simply looking at 2x cubed. What I know is that it's odd and it's positive. That tells me it has to go down on the left, up on the right. So here's what happens when I try to sketch this graph. Now I will tell you, just to help a little bit with turning points, they should occur most of the time um, about halfway between two zeros because there is still some element of symmetry that you typically find in these graphs. So somewhere between negative one and negative two is where I'm gonna have a turning point what I don't know is where it occurs. It might go up just a little bit. It might go up quite a bit. So that's the part that I'm going to give you some flexibility on. Most likely, as you're looking at graphing options in a multiple choice format, you would be able to then determine. It's not as if the turning points will be the only thing that's different between the graphs. Um, the turning points will not be what you're focusing on. You're going to look at in behavior and you're going to look at zeros primarily. So I'm going to just guess that if I go up maybe about here and I turn around, I'm going to pass back through this zero at negative one half. Now, because I have the y intercept at negative six, and I can tell it looks like I need to go below it before I come back up. I'm going to go down a little bit past that, and then when I come up, I know my end behavior has to go up on the right. So that will give us a general idea of what this graph looks like. Is it perfect? Probably not. I do not want you to graph this in a graphing calculator. I want you to be able to show me this information that you're able to graph it by hand. One more example, and that is when it is written in factored form or root form. Remember, if it's written this way, we actually see those zeros in the equation because I would have to set each of these parentheses equal to zero and solve. And what that tells me is I have a zero at negative two because if I set x plus two equal to zero and solve, I get it at negative two, but notice there is an exponent. Think of it as having had this parentheses written out three times. That has a multiplicity of three. What does that tell me about the behavior at the zero? Well, that's an odd multiplicity. That's going to be a wiggle as it goes through. I'm going to have to think about that concavity issue. Now, I also have a zero at positive one because if I set x minus one equal to zero and solve, I'll get x equals positive one. And that has an exponent of 2, so that tells me it has multiplicity of 2. Therefore, it would be a touch or a bounce when it gets to the x-axis. So in just a moment, we're going to scroll down here just a little bit. And I'm going to include this information. A 0 at negative 2, that's going to be a wiggle. And at positive 1, and that's going to be a touch or a bounce. So I'm simply going to mark these points on the graph, and then we'll come back when it's time to sketch the graph and pay attention to the wiggle and the touch. Now, my step two means I need to find the y-intercept. And remember, that occurs at f of zero. I'm going to plug in zero for x. 
So I'm going to have 0 plus 2 squared, oh, sorry, cubed. And I'm going to have 0 minus 1 squared. So when I have 0 plus 2, that's 2 cubed. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. 0 minus 1 is negative 1, but when I square it, it becomes a positive 1. So f of 0 is equal to a positive 8. And that means I'm going to cross the y-axis at the point 0, 8. Okay, last thing I need is in behavior. Now this you may be wondering about because it's not in standard form. So how would we know what would be that leading term? Well, there's actually a simpler way to look at this if you think about it. If I were to write this out without the exponents, it would be x plus 2, I'd have 3 of those, and then I'd have the x minus 1 2 times. Now, if we were to expand this, in other words, we'd have to use FOIL, and then we'd have to take that and then multiply that trinomial times the next binomial and keep on going. Think of it just the same way as when you, you do FOIL. You have to start off by multiplying first terms together. All I need to look at is first times first times first times first times first. That tells me I'm multiplying x together five times. That's all I need is to know what that first term would be if this were expanded out. It would be x to the fifth. So in deciding in behavior, I just ask myself what will be true if the first term is x to the fifth. Well, it's odd, and it's positive, so that means down on the left, up on the right. And I'm ready to graph now. What I do know is this. As it goes through negative 2, because that had multiplicity of 3, I've got a little bit of a wiggle. So what that tells me is that my curve is actually going to do something kind of like this. And if I look at my graph, that's fairly close, although it may actually go up a little bit and then come back down through that y value. And again, I'm not going to hold you responsible for having your turning points exactly in the right place. But remember, when I get to 1, that's a touch. In other words, this is going to bounce off, go back up, and I would get a graph that is somewhat similar to this when I sketch it. All right, the last piece of information we're going to fill in is also vocabulary related. We've been building on this through the whole course. Let's make sure that we get the idea um, straight as to what all these terms mean. So if I have some polynomial function f and some value a is an x-intercept of the graph of that function. So in other words, I'm asking you what are the different ways you can express what a is besides saying that it's an x-intercept. Well, you could tell me that it's a zero of the function. That's what an x-intercept is, right? You could also tell me that it is a root or a solution of the function. All those words mean exactly the same thing. And if I saw x minus a, what I would know is that that is a factor of the function. So make certain that this vocabulary makes sense to you.